Other Worlds and Their Stories by J. Riley Peake. Copyright 2017 by SC Treehouse. All rights reserved. Stories by J. Riley Peake. Illustrated and edited by Christopher D. Stewart. Narrated by Heidi Olson. Dedication from the editor. For my best friend Riley, you made this book possible, but only because you didn't finish the other one I planned to publish. And for Kimberly, you made a good double agent during the publication of this. Introduction The question regarding whether or not other planets share Earth's unique ability to real life is a question many ask. However, because men much smarter and, consequentially, more handsome than I, have undertaken this very thing to no avail, I resign myself to the idea that I must leave such a search alone. Despite my lack of credentials in this field, though, there is, in fact, another discussion to which I can speak. For I can speak of worlds. And why bother talking about planets when one could speak about worlds? From the time humanity first filled its lungs with breath, we have looked to the skies for other worlds. It has only been recently that the smartest of men thought to look down instead of up. Indeed, I myself have discovered worlds both above and below. The problem is not where they're looking. It's what they are using to look with. You can't observe them with your eyes. You can't see the scent of a rose, nor can you watch the internal shattering of someone's heart. Like sound or emotion, there are indeed other worlds, ones both deep, dark, and mysterious, as well as light, high, and hopeful. Both the smell of a flower and the throes of despair are real experiences. We just don't see them with our eyes. Story 3. The Economic Endeavors of Orville and Rufus. Act 1, Scene 1. Setting. A street in front of a factory in London in the year 1827. Scuffling heard from within the factory. Doors burst open as Orville and Rufus are tossed headlong out of the factory by Boss, who looks very angry. Boss. Fired! Both of you! And don't even think about stepping one foot back in here, or you'll be thrown from the second story instead of the first! Slams door shut. Orville getting to his feet. Why, then, never that, man! Anyone with a brain could have seen that our methods would have improved the factory speed to its utmost capacity. We simply needed a few more trousers. Rufus, still lying on the ground, moaning. Oh, but Orville, now we're fired. We have to start all over and find new jobs. Find new jobs? dropping down on his hands and knees beside Rufus. Rufus, we have been wronged by the system. Are we simply puppets within its clutches so that we merely follow its every bidding? No! Jumps back to feet, working himself up. I'll say it again. We have been wronged by the system. And in our case, the only right is for us to wrong them with an equally wrong sort of wrong. Rufus stands up, unable to keep up with Orville's raving. What do you mean, Orville? We are turning to a life of crime. Rufus's expression never changes. But, Orville, there are such nice people around here. Don't think on it, Rufus. You'll lose your nerve if you start thinking like that. Our objective is to remain equally cold and ruthless towards all, disregarding their amount of connection with our plight. Rufus nodding his understanding. All right, Orville. So, where do we start? Orville cringing at what he sees as such a rhetorical question. Why, where there's people, of course. Really, Rufus, you should think before you speak. Stopping Rufus before he can open his mouth to ask another question. No more. Follow me and you will understand. Orville exits. Rufus, shrugging his shoulders. I'll follow, but I'm not sure I'll ever understand. Rufus exits. Act 1, Scene 2. Setting. A park midday. People are strolling around. Orville and Rufus enter. Orville spreading his arms wide. Ah, here we are. The perfect location for our sort. We should find our work quite simply in this sort of crowd. Orville, what exactly are we doing? Orville cringes, starts to rebuke Rufus for foolish questions, then decides to spare Rufus this time.
We are engaging in the common income of every criminal in this town. Pickpocketing. How do we do that, Orville? Shouldn't we practice first? Rufus, this is the commonest sort of thing in the business. If we can't pull this off, we might as well throw in our glittering careers. Honestly, how hard could it be? Rather like picking cabbage, I suppose. Points at Sergeant Wilbur, who is strolling by. And there's our first subject. Ripe for the picking, judging by his apparel. Leans over and whispers to Rufus. Here's the plan. I'll take the front and distract the chap. You come from behind and harvest his pockets. Rufus, weakly. Orville, I don't know if I can do this. No time for such pessimism, Rufus. It's time to start our new business venture. Runs to catch up with Sergeant Wilbur, then falls into a casual pace beside him. Orville looks over and acts as though he has just noticed Sergeant Wilbur. Oh, good day, sir. And how is your day in this fine establishment treating you today? Casts a large wink back at Rufus. Sergeant Wilbur noticing Orville. What's that? Oh, quite delightful, I should say. Yes, rather splendid, in fact. How nice. Blatantly stepping in front of Sergeant Wilbur, placing the man between Orville and Rufus and forcing him to stop his walking. And what brings you here today? Why, it's my particular custom. I always come to this park at precisely 1.47pm every day. Orville making subtle gesture for Rufus to move in. Rufus shakes his head and shifts his feet. Is that so? Orville continues to make increasingly less subtle gestures at Rufus, with Rufus persisting in his nervous refusal to act, as Sergeant Wilbur says next line. Certainly, it's quite irregular if I don't. Pulls out a schedule from his pocket. You see, I keep a very tight schedule. If I were to stray in the slightest detail, why, I should say I would be behind for the rest of the week. Orville, snapping back to attention. Oh, yes, that would be a bother. Sergeant Wilbur, returning the schedule to his pocket. Most assuredly, it's a bothersome load at times, but I find that maintaining a tight operation is the only way to get things done. Right you are, my dear fellow. Orville casts a venomous look over Sergeant Wilbur at Rufus as he says the next line. There's lots to be learned in that type of doctrine, getting things done. Quite right, reminiscing. Why, back in the army, that was always the first thing I put into those lads. How to accomplish something with those hands of theirs. Certainly, they all needed to know how to, looks up at Rufus. Scoop up their lily lace tarts and do something with their hands. Sergeant Wilbur, oblivious, nodding his head at memories. Quite right. Orville begins to walk away, speaks to Sergeant Wilbur, but his disgusted gaze is set on Rufus. Pardon me, but I'm sure you're running late for something or another. Sergeant Wilbur, stirring from his memories. Eh? What? Oh. Pulls schedule out of pocket. Great Scott, I'm nearly behind schedule. Runs through the park, knocking people aside. Make way, I'm late, charge! Sergeant Wilbur exits. Orville walks over to Rufus, sums up his disgust. Rufus, you ninny. Act Two, Scene One. Setting. In Rufus's house. The room is simple, with a sofa against the right side of the back wall. Beside it is a small table. Thrown across the floor is a large, decidedly ugly carpet. On the left side of the back wall is a door. Rufus enters, walking through the room, when a swift, sharp knock is heard upon the door. Rufus moves towards the door. Coming! Opens door. Orville enters through it. Top of the morning, Rufus! Hello, Orville. Would you like some? Orville motions for Rufus to hold his small talk. Hush, we have more important things to tend to. I spent half the night pondering my intellect upon our precise predicament, and I have found a solution to our economic deficiencies that even a spineless individual like you should be able to contribute in. Rufus, embarrassed at the mention of his failure of the previous day. What's that, Orville? Street side performance. Orville? I don't know if we should... Rufus, this is not the place for more of your pessimism. I have done my research on this topic and feel that we shall excel at it. Now, follow me. Opens door. To where, Orville? Orville, 
taken aback by such a foolish question. Why, Rufus, we cannot be street side performers without a proper street side. Come along now. Orville and Rufus exit through the door. Act 2, Scene 2. Setting. A busy street in London. People move about, tending to their daily tasks. A shopkeeper is perched precariously atop a lightly framed ladder, attempting to hang up a bulky sign for his shop. Further down, a man sits with his back against the buildings, playing a twangy-sounding instrument. A man strolls around the street with a wheelbarrow of produce, seeking to sell his wares. Orville and Rufus enter. I would think that this should do just fine. We'll set up shop here, Rufus. Rufus, looking around the street. Orville, precisely how does this work? It's quite fascinating. We simply engage in some elaborate spectacle and people give us money. <laughs> it's absolutely extraordinary what people will do these days. Could we get into trouble? Orville, waving his hand dismissively. Pish posh, I've been observing this phenomenon all morning. I went out at the break of dawn so as to establish myself in full camouflage before the arrival of the skilled artisans of this trade. When they began that work, I observed the customs involved in this kind of labour. I should have within my intellect all the knowledge required for our success. They moved to the side of the street. All right, well, what do we do first? First, we set up shop. Reaches into coat and withdraws a small wooden box, which he places upon the ground between them. Right, straightening back up. Now we perform. Rufus, nodding his head. And what are we going to do, Orville? Orville looks up at Rufus with an expression of blank thought, then smiles. That, dear fellow, is where you come in. Me? But how should I know what to perform? I'm no actor. And that's why you will succeed. You're looking at this the wrong way, Rufus. Sweeps arm in the direction of the people going down the street. These people don't want an act. They want true talent. They want to see how you exploit the raw resources and potential which you have within yourself. They want the show. They want to be your first fans. Really? Orville nods. Wow. So then. What do you say? Rufus, straightening up, speaks with new confidence. Just follow my lead. Orville, caught off guard by the sudden change in his friend. Uh, th th there's a good lad. Rufus takes a deep breath, then bounces and stomps out a beat. Then he gestures to Orville, who mirrors his companion's display and passes it back to Rufus upon completion. Rufus continues the phenomenon, making it more elaborate, then passes it back. The two of them pass it back and forth for a time, then launch into it together. The man down the street with the instrument notices the dancing and strikes up a tempo to match their dance, and leads the dancers to increase the speed. The people in the street walk by without the slightest interest. Rufus, still dancing, nodding his head toward the people on the street. <laughs> they don't seem to be interested. <sighs> Orville, still dancing. Then we shall employ the tactics of the trade, taking the show to them. Follow me! Orville and Rufus begin to dance their way out into the street, but as they proceed, Orville bumps into the ladder of the precariously perched shopkeeper, causing the shopkeeper to fall off the ladder and straight into the wheelbarrow of the produce salesman. Orville, grabbing Rufus, who is still dancing. <laughs> Spot on performance, my friend. However, I now feel that a vanishing act is in order. Orville and Rufus run off stage. Act 2, Scene 3. Setting. Quays of London. Barrels and various cargo sit around. Orville and Rufus enter, panting. Well, that could have turned ugly. Oh, but Orville, we still didn't make anything. Rufus, you really should do something about that pessimism of yours. It's quite exasperating. However... You've assessed the issue rather precisely. We are still very firmly in a hole. What should we do next, Orville? <sighs> I don't know, old chap. I'm afraid I've quite washed out at this point. Sits heavily upon a coil of ropes. Perhaps we should just throw in the towel. Go back to being ill-fated puppets of the system. If you say so, Orville. It's a sad fate, but who are we to argue? It is simply our lot in life, I suppose. Orville rises from his seat. He and Rufus start to leave, 
but the sound of a steamboat horn off stage draws Orville's attention. He stops and stares off stage at it for a moment, then runs to Rufus, Orville taking Rufus by the shoulder. Rufus, old boy, how do you feel about America? Rufus stares at Orville in confusion for a moment. Orville points back off stage at the steamboat. Rufus stares at it for a moment. Then a smile spreads across his face as he understands. I think that sounds all right. Orville and Rufus run off stage in the direction of the steamboat. The End You've been listening to Other Worlds by J. Riley Peak, Produced by SC Treehouse, copyright 2017. Narrated by Heidi Olson. Thanks for listening.